Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ruth Wishart. I'm very happy to be chairing this event at the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Um, and our guest this evening is, uh, is what we might call a political detective. <laughs> Uh, the events on which he's eavesdropped um, at close quarters include some of the most momentous global happenings of our times, from civic uprisings to economic meltdowns. And in between crouching with a microphone in some unforgiving locations, he's also variously served as the business, economics, culture and digital editors for both BBC's Newsnight and Channel 4 News. Perhaps weary of the constraints imposed by public service broadcasting, he then became a freelance whose views on what ails the body politic are much sought after in studios both here and abroad. His own politics he once described as lefty activism and I suspect that's still probably the case. Yet not least because of our current travails, uh, he's a co complex relationship I think we can say with the People's Party on whose behalf he has knocked many doors. And indeed with its leader of which more later and I fear the B word may come up. His latest book, Clear Bright Future, covers a huge canvas from the imperative of rediscovering and applying humanist um, communitarian values to the urgent need to address the relationship between humankind and the ever more clever machines now deployed to assist or indeed to replace us. It's a dizzying book, it's a thought-provoking book, a journey through many philosophies and societies. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Paul Mason. Thank you. Is there a riot going on? Is it a riot? What is it? You sing, you sing for the second half. Can the New York Times not get soundproofing? Is there something wrong with it? <laughs> I, I, I like the sound of this. We'll have you if you don't mind. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Go for it. All right, I'm meant to, I'm meant to give an introduction. You right, are. I am, okay. Shall I stand up? Or That's sit down? entirely up I might you. do that, I can see more people, but stop me after seven minutes, Ruth. So, okay. Well, I, I mean, I can't tell you what my book's about in seven minutes, but I can tell you what the relevance of my book is to the situation you are reading about uh, and listening to in today's headlines. The world's on fire, correct? The world is on fire. The Amazon is literally on fire. The Arctic is melting. But that's not our main problem. Our main problem is we've got a political, situa political system that cannot deal with this problem. Uh, all the, the only thing that's going to stop the world melting and burning is a global multilateral order based on rules that is even susceptible to another Kyoto Treaty or a Paris Accord, and that is breaking down. The global multilateral system is breaking down. And my book, published in May this year, tries to explain the reasons why, and in a good old-fashioned way one learns in engineering from Mr. Toyota, in fact, the man who invented Toyota. Uh, when you find out one why, you ask for another one. Why has this gone wrong? And why was that? And why was that? Until you trace, if you can, the problem down to a few multiple root causes. And what I've done in the book is, is trace it down to three crises. We've got an economic crisis. We've got an economic system that doesn't work for most people. It blew up in 2008, we fixed it back together, but most people don't know how their child's life is gonna be better than theirs. And because for 10 years, people like me who said, it's very deep, the problem, it's not a 10 year crisis, it's a 50 year crisis, it's massive, were ignored, that's now become a political crisis. It's become in fact, a crisis of belief in democracy. 52% of you, according to the Hansard Society, 52% of British electorate, uh, the British voters, would rather a strong man come to power who breaks all the rules and saves them than democracy continues. And that's happening all over the world. Uh, and we haven't yet gone right the way to the bottom of the helter skelter uh, where one ends up. Um, where do you end up? We, I've just spent two hours uh, before reading out so the, the works of imprisoned writers who were here in 2015 from Turkey. No, they're not here selling their and, and signing their book. They're imprisoned for life without parole. 
So that's the, where you get to when it finally goes wrong. We haven't got there yet. But the third thing, and the, the, most, the, the, the third crisis, the one that triggered me to write the book, but which is perhaps not so front of mind for most of you, is we've got a, t a crisis of technological control. We've got a crisis whereby Cambridge Analytica and Facebook can steal an election or facilitate, uh, whether it's Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin, whoever it turns out to have been. They will, and, and of course, there is an industry of election stealing. Uh, some of the people involved in it are now MEPs for the Brexit party. Uh, election stealing in Kenya, election stealing in Nigeria, where there are much uh, uh, fewer checks and balances. The, it is not simply done by the old means of driving into the village and paying everybody. It is done through the technological means of mobile phones, of smartphones, of the internet, of Facebook, and of Cambridge Analytica, of big data. Now, when I, as I was covering this, this emergent set of problems, so you know that I covered the 2008 crisis, you know that in 2015 I was in Greece during the, uh, during the, 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 the absolute <coughs> catastrophe that was inflicted on them by the IMF, World Bank, etc., uh, uh, ECB. As I was covering this morphing of the economic into the political, it occurred to me that there might be a deeper why. There might be something deeper going on than simply the fragmentation 1930s style of the world order and a 1929 style economic crash. And, and what I think is happening is what I call in the book the crisis of the neoliberal self. Neoliberalism is the system 30 years of free market economics. If you don't want to call it neoliberalism, many of our friends on the right hate the word neoliberalism, call it Fred. I don't care what the system is called. I just know its attributes have been to set everybody against each other in an acquisitive and competitive way where everybody became centered on the individual. And in the book, I trace how from the Brazilian favelas to my hometown, Lee, in Lancashire, to, uh, to large parts of the world, this evisceration of community and cooperation in favor of this, this, the, the kind of individuals at war with one another created a certain kind of self, a self-image, a, a view of what the world is like. And then, bang, that world that sustains that self has collapsed in a very short space of time. Uh, it collapsed economically in 2008, and is from, I would date from about 2013-14 from the invasion of, of Ukraine, the, the Turkish uprising, and then the referendum here, the Gaza war, this, this, and I covered all of these things, the, 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 the relentless chaoticification of the world. Uh, that self, it, 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 it's, 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 it's knowing a hostile environment. And, and, and above all, that self which is centered in, in kind of quite liberal people, progressive people, who kind of assumed that something had gone wrong in 2008 and that we would never have you know, a Trump or a kind, of, uh, a kind of Boris Johnson type figure. That was a joke. It's no longer a joke. And the selves that we built in that period where neoliberalism, where free market economics did deliver to many people are utterly disorientated. And, and I'll leave you with a kind of meta, right, I think what me and Ruth have decided we're going to go right into the politics of now in a minute and, and hopefully take you on, on a, a route towards some, some way through it and some hope insofar as we can find it. But I will step away from that a bit and, and leave you with a, a, a point that is the kind of the basic point of the book. Suppose I asked you to submit all decisions in your life to an intelligent machine who you love, what work you do, what clothes you wear, uh, where you go on holiday, um, must be decided by the machine. And suppose I told you that the machine is more intelligent than you, and that the worst thing you could do with it is try and, you know, try and basically control it. Don't try and correct it if you think it's done something wrong. Just let it make the decisions and go with them. I hope you would tell me to get lost, or whatever the Edinburgh equivalent of get lost is. Uh, and suppose I then said to you that the government must subject its decisions to the machine as well. And that if the government, whatever the government decides, the machine must say yes or no. I hope, again, you would say whatever it is, the Edinburgh equivalent of get lost. But if you then substitute the word machine for market, 
That is what you've been doing for 30 years. That is what the neoliberal self decided to do. We were told that markets represent the collective intelligence of human beings and that nobody, no individual can second guess the market. And the government must do what the market wants to do. With that metaphor, I want to try and convince you of the depths to which we've handed agency, in fact, to a machine. Because a market is simply an autonomous system created by human action and we let go and it carries on. A state. Thomas Hobbes, the English philosopher of the Reformation, called his book The Leviathan, trying to explain why states arise and where do they get their authority from. And, and the first line of The Leviathan says, the state is an artificial sort of a man. In other words, the state is an automaton. The state is a machine. And of course, Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, the technological huge behemoths to which we have, the technological leviathans, to be honest, to which we have handed control increasingly in the last 10 years, they are machines as well. I think that we are facing a big crisis of loss of autonomy to, to automated systems, whether they are economies, states, or actual big tech. And that to recover our autonomy and recover our agency, and the back third of the book is about this. I don't know how, how far we'll get into this. I don't, I don't know how far we'll get into Aristotelian Marxism and, and Alistair Not McIntyre. Very. No, but, <laughs> no, but, 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 it is, the argument is that if we're going to recover the agency, we must have in our minds a theory of what a human being is and why we want to defend its rights against, against economies, against political systems, and against technology. And if you don't have a theory of what a human being is, call it a theory of human nature, if you do not want to conduct a defense of the human being and their right to agency and their universal human rights, what is going to happen? Just as now we have companies, you know, in the form of, even today, these big logging companies in Brazil have set the world on fire. Literally, they've set the rainforest on fire to do over the rights of indigenous people and, and peasants in Brazil. They don't care about those rights. Politicians increasingly question the, the, the veracity of human rights, whether it's Xi Jinping in China or whether it's Trump in America, human rights are right in the crosshairs of these authoritarian governments. And as for Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, Google, they, they don't operate in a world of human rights. Not, not, not really. Sometimes voluntarily they talk about them. And we need, we will in this century, I'll leave you with this, we will in this century face because in artificial intelligence will get good enough to do this. At some point, the machine will ask us, on what basis do you, the puny human beings, demand control over me, the intelligent machine? That is only the latest iteration of many struggles humanity has had over control over autonomous systems, political systems, economies that we create. But if we go into, this is the thing, if we go into that century and that battle without winning the ones we're about to fight, we'll, do, we'll be in a terrible situation because, because we could lose, see, I think you know, we could lose prosperity really easily, we could lose growth really easily, there could be stagnation really easily. That's, that's 50 to 70 years since the Second World War you know, the, 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 you're, losing, you're losing a 50 to 70 year period. But if you lose rationality and science and the belief in it, and the belief in law-based societies, you're losing the enlightenment. And I hope in Edinburgh, you would realize that that would be a very bad thing to do. The curious thing, Paul, that almost all the men that have sat in this chair or that chair have all said, don't let me speak for more than seven minutes. And do you know what? Well, they always do. They do. Oh, that's all right. It was 15. That's all right. all right. That's perfectly all right because we're, not, we're going to let plenty of time for these folk to have their way with you, metaphorically speaking. Okay. 
thank you. Um, but let me just let me just pick up on one or two things. You, you talked about I talk about the politics of now, and I want to go onto that. But but there is a quote um, from from the book that, that leapt out me, and it says to re-establish order and predictability in the world, we need to restore what the neoliberal stripped out: three-dimensional human beings with a belief in restraint, kindness, mutual obligation, and democracy. And I'm wondering if you're holding your breath for this. Well. I meet such people all the time, uh, but I also meet their opposites. And I, I start the book with the, the discussion I had with a Trump supporter in the uh, inauguration in, in Washington, D.C., on day one of the Trump administration. And it was a guy who, uh, you know, and I say this, I'm saying this not in order to be incendiary, but I think it characterizes so many people who have thrown their lot in with these authoritarian politicians. It is, he had adopted a position of calculated ignorance. So it doesn't mean he was stupid and had no, a low IQ. I think he was in a high IQ. Um, he was a, 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 a cattle farmer from Tennessee. And he was, he was trying to convince me that, the, that camel skeletons had been found in, in Antarctica and that this meant that the Earth had once turned on its axis and that probably that meant that climate change was just, as he put it, what goes around comes around. And then he says, and, 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 and they're trying to make me pay a methane tax uh, because cows fart. And, um, and, and I said, well, who do you think pays for the CIA? You know, who do you think pays for you know, the, the army? You like that. You, know, you need taxes, don't you? And then he said to me, look at them, the protesters. We were in the protest. He was just looking at the protesters, a bit askance. And he said, look at them. And then he said, look at them with their baseball hats and their, and their sneakers. And I looked at them, and, and there wasn't a baseball hat or sneaker there. They were anarchists, and they had balaclavas, and they had Palestinian scarves, and they had Doc Martens. And I realized that he was seeing the protesters, and in his mind's eye, he was seeing black people from Tennessee. And because then he started saying to me that they're all on welfare, and all they want is money, and he kept doing that with his hand like that. All they want is money. These people, there is no arguing with them, right? So th th there is defeating them. I'm afraid it's like, you know, I, I'm afraid our grandfather's generation, my grandmother's generation, had to do with the last vestiges of the Nazi SS. We have to defeat them. And one can defeat them by understanding where they come from and what, how terrible their lives have been. I'm sorry, the life of a Tennessee cattle farmer, rich on handouts from the American state, burning the grassland, you know, is not that bad. And, it, and, and we have to learn a kind of... Uh, uh, one of the things I'm very keen on is virtues, or I call them in the book reflexes. But, th but to learn virtues of toughness towards people who have adopted calculated ignorance. Now, you know, we can try to show them that, that climate science exists and that taxes are logical and that the people in the park are not black, they're students, and the black people here have civil rights. But in the end, a large part of the, the population of the Western world has adopted the viewpoint that that doesn't matter to them. Can they I have thrown their lot in with a section of the elite who will use this to smash up the global multilateral order. And it's a fight now. I mean, it, I, I, even since writing, you know, now we're, you know, this autumn, it, there is a fight coming in this country. And I want to convince people on the doorstep not to vote for No Deal Brexit or Boris Johnson or Farage's um, private company. Uh, but, but we have to reconcile our minds to the, the, the fact that there are people to, who will not be convinced in any other way. Well, I wanted to pull out something else so that when you were talking about that, and you were talking about the election of Trump, and to a certain extent it, it, it also pertains to the Faragistas and to um, the Brexit Party and all of that. You said that when Trump was elected, there was immediately an outpouring of journalistic garbage about the white wor working class and, yep. its, and, its, and its deprivation. And you say it's lack of education and racism and sexism that informs these prejudices. It's not actually um, poverty or, or a lack so of opportunity. Okay, so I'm white and I'm male, and I come from working class background. I mean, I wouldn't, I, w whatever I am now, you know, earning my, you know, freelance uh, pittance for the new statesman. Uh, but the point is, I don't think the white working class exists. I think it's an invention. It's, it's like, you, you know, in the colonial period, um, the, col the colonists invented identities for colonized people. 
I think in a way, you know, the, 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 the British monarchy almost did it for Scotland with, in the, with the Highland clearances. They invented a Scottish Highland character that was in their minds, that wasn't necessarily in your minds, but I'm absolutely sure that they did it with India, with China. The, the, the image of the coolie, the image of, 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 the, of the subservient, sub-Saharan African person is a persona that the rulers impose on you. And, and, and I'm afraid white working class seems to me to be that. It is something that people like Farage, people like Trump, you know, and their acolytes are trying to do. The working, even though I came from a largely white town, it wasn't all white in the 60s. And not only that, it was very largely Irish, Ukrainian, and Polish because of the post-war migration of miners into Lee, as we, there was Polish and Ukrainian mining uh, migration into Scotland. It's the same phenomenon. We didn't feel unified in that sense. And, and we certainly didn't feel unified around whiteness because I can remember my dad being really proud of the fact this Paul Robeson, daft Paul Robeson uh, film called Pro Proud Valley, where Paul Robeson goes down a mine. And the key line in it, I'll quote it inaccurately, is something like, the Welsh miners say to Paul Robeson, um, don't worry, boy, you know, boy oh, you know, down the mine, we are all black. So uh, that, you know, I'm not having my identity stolen from me by somebody trying to impose this new thing, white working class. However, what's happening, the academic research shows this, both here, but especially in the United States, is there are a series of sociological characteristics that make you predisposed to voting for the far right, to, to you know, uh, to taking part in all the activities as well that increasingly the, the American uh, ultra-right politics demands. Um, one of them is fatalism. And when I read this, it, it chimed in with a, well, a big thesis I had already formed in the book that, that one of the key problems of the neoliberal character is, is the mass, adopt uh, mass adoption of fatalism by people. If the market rules my life, if politics is up there and I can't affect it, basically, my life's like a casino. Either I'm lucky, or, you know, and I become a premiership footballer, or win X Factor, or Love Island, and I can be famous, or I'm doomed. And if you've got teenage children, this is the ideology that is very pervasive among young people, that there's nothing you can do to, to shape your life unless you're lucky. Now, the fact is that one of the key um, indicators that you're going to vote for Trump, and increasingly, of, uh, I think it's anecdotally true, I've not seen it academically proven, around the Brexit party, is if you believe getting a university degree is useless. But it's certainly there in the Trump uh, research that a lot of people who vote for Trump are equally poor to other people, uh, but they believe that education is a waste of time because they believe in fatalism. Um, what we're not seeing is an authoritarian character. In the 1930s, the, the, one of the sociologists I quote, Eric Fromm, uh, was one of the people who, who, was, who first discovered the idea of an authoritarian rebel. In the 30s, you may know that some c communist, far left communists switched to Nazism after Hitler came to power. And what Fromm found among those people from survey evidence is that they had hated uh, uh, they hated sort of the, the, the elite, you know, they hated the, the kind of Prussian aristocracy, but they had no feelings of um, progressive uh, sort of kind of kindness towards anybody. Um, no, we're not seeing that. But what we're seeing is a series of characteristics. Um, and I, I, what I'm arguing is it's nothing to do with the sociological thing of living in a working class town and being white. It is um, being violently misogynistic. It, I argue in the book that this is almost the number one, glue number one of the new international right. It's not even racism, although the racism is glue number two. But new, glue number one is violent misogyny. And, and, and the reason it's so, and it's come under the radar, and it's been so left field for many of us, and we found it so difficult to predict that this would be the case, is that, generally speaking, most people in this room, you're not playing computer games. You're not playing online computer games. Sit with your 16-year-old male while with the with the headphones on uh, while they're playing the computer games, and you will hear the world that that if you follow politics is Gamergate, 
which is the online harassment of women who critique sexism in games. Uh, and then you will hear uh, this world of, of you know, uh, the, the whole world of hating um, feminism, anti-feminism, you know, the, the feminazis, all of that. The theory that is, that is prevalent among such people is that there should be a, a, a hierarchy in the human race. Alpha males, that is men with big chests, you know, the Nietzschean men with chests, uh, big jutting jaws, good looking men, they should get pretty girlfriends. Beta males should get the next prettiest girlfriend and girlfriends should have what they're taken. That theory is a folk religion among large parts of the English-speaking male world. It's just you don't know about it because it isn't said on TV. What's wrong with the world for them is feminism because feminism gives women the ability to say to the fuck you to the alpha male or whatever they want to do or to be lesbian or trans or whatever they want to be. The world is out of joint for these guys and, and, and you may say, well, who, who goes on, who, 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 who cares about that? 250,000 people subscribe to the, to the bulletin board, uh, that's th the main bulletin board that, that discusses this. 70 million people play computer games. And so, so what I'm trying to say is, yes, there is a sociological explanation for what's causing this mass movement towards radical right-wing thought, but it isn't primarily the economic depredation of white working class people Although white working class people, yes, of course, are suffering from really h bad hardships in both America and here that are contingent on what neoliberalism has done to them. I, I want to get you paused there, Paul, because just like the boot, you're throwing out so many um, ideas. Sorry. No, 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 it's, it's lovely. It's very refreshing. But let's just try and pick up on a couple of them. I mean, one of the great ironies of now is that there's supposedly a... a a people's march against the elite, except it's the elite that they're electing yeah. to, to, to do this for them, and, and that makes no kind of sense at all. And secondly, just as a, a yeah. throwaway line, um, you talk about fatalism, there is in fact a Scottish version of this, and it's called, what's for you, no go by you. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't ask yeah. you to... No, you I think I understand that. But, uh, okay. Um, sorry, the first point, you've, you've thrown about me so the, much... About, about hiring the elites in, yeah, order, okay, to, in order to... It, in the book, there's a chapter called Reading Hannah Arendt is Not Enough. But reading H Hannah Arendt is a really good place to start. And I say this as a Marxist who would be very critical of Arendt. Arendt, you know, Arendt is a li liberal conservative thinker of the mid 20th, 20th century. Uh, but her understanding of what, what, we, the, what we were up against with Nazism, I think, should inform. <laughs> They're not getting that, you no, honestly. No, it should should inform the way we understand what's happening now. Because Arendt describes in the rise of Nazism what she called the temporary alliance of the elite and the mob, and she anatomizes it very clearly. She anatomizes the psychology of the mob, as she calls them, and, and, and together with Eric Fromm, who I talked about before, observed the tiredness the tiredness of living in a relentlessly bureaucratic and, 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 and disorganized society, making people susceptible to being browbeaten by leaders into certain forms of action. But in a brilliant phrase, she said, what, what they wanted and what the Nazis gave them, both the elite and the mob, was, she says, access to history even at the price of destruction. And so, okay, let's unpack that. What we're seeing here are two sets of people. A set of people in the elite, and there is an elite, I'm afraid, you know, people who don't like leftists using the word elite. Well, you know, when my dad worked in a factory and he went on strike, the boss used to come down and sit on a beer crate, hand the beer out and negotiate with them. Today, if such a factory even existed, one would not know who the bosses were. There'd be a hedge fund somewhere. It'd be a Singaporean you know, state investment company. The elite exists up there in the, in, the, you know, in the Jeffrey Epstein, Prince Andrew world. That's the elite. That's what we were talking about. Um, Are there any lawyers in the house? Well, <laughs> the, the world exists. Um, uh, and no a section of it has, a, has broken from its old project. The old project was the... the, the the capitalist cookie jar, which is we create a financial system 
uh, into which everybody can dip according to risk or reward. You know, risk matches reward. Reward matches risk. If you want to invest in, in Argentinian bonds, you get a high rate of return, but you could lose your money. You invest in, you know, uh, you know, British gilts, you get a low rate of return, can't pay your pension, can't live on it, but you're not going to hopefully lose your money. That's the old way, of, that's neoliberalism. That's what we, they created for 30 years. But it's not good enough for several people. It's not good enough for hedge funders because they need to constantly break the rules. It's not good enough either for anybody involved in the fossil fuel industry because if we implement Paris, then the fossil fuel industry goes out of business. Um, and what you see also, of course, is not good enough for any industry that is basically organised crime with lipstick on. So, you know, the, the speculative developments are all around, are, are all around us in, in Western cities right now. They need this rules-free environment where they can just, you know, they can just deport entire populations, create these poor doors where poor people's kids can't play in the playground of the rich people's apartment block. This set of people exists everywhere, and you'll find them backing the same thing everywhere. A, a Trump, a Salvini in Italy, a Boris Johnson in Britain, uh, a Farage in Britain, um, Orban in Hungary, Erdogan in, in Turkey. The, this section of the elite can't live with the orderly global system anymore, so it has to break it. And here's the difference in the 30s. In the 30s, really, it was a different kind of crisis because because each of these ailing old imperialist countries like Italy, Spain, um, Germany couldn't find their, their place in the world order and they had to break the world order to find a space, Japan also. This time it's different. What you've got is the, the far right or the ultra-nationalist right in every country collaborating with each other to break the world order to their mutual benefit. Because what capital, David Koch has died today um, he'll, he's, 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 he's there with Thatcher and Pinochet uh, uh, in the same place. Um, <laughs> David Koch, you know, uh, spent hundreds of millions on climate science denial because his industry, Koch Brothers Industry, Koch Industries, which backs Mike Pence to the hilt and, and, and is a supporter of Trump, you know, needs climate science to be disproved. So it's, it's people like them. And then people in, we just talked about, the people among the masses who need history to be in reverse, men who want it to go back to when everything was like Doris Day. You know, it was like when, 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 your, when your wife was at home, you know, with the cooking at 5 p.m., that, those kind of halcyon 1950s, you know, weird kind of utopias that the right has, they, that is a reversal of history. So why do we get movements of poor people and rich people in support of the same thing is because as Arendt brilliantly tells us, they both need access to history in order to reverse it. And then here's where the problem comes. Again, what did she say? Even at the cost of destruction. So they, they know that the best thing to do, best thing to make money, if you're a hedge funder who, who trades volatility, who's got a computer, as Robert Mercer has, the biggest backer of Trump, Renaissance Technologies, they have a computer that can outthink most market players. What's the ideal circumstance for that computer? Chaos. What's the ideal circumstance for Breitbart, which is a money-making, uh, right-wing, quasi-fascist uh, online new newspaper in America? Chaos. It, has, uh, it doesn't even have to say migrant rape anymore. It just, if, if there's a rape in Sweden, Breitbart, support, Breitbart will report it. Because for them and their readers, the more rapes in Sweden, the better, because that's gonna, the, the migrants in Sweden are going to get the blame. So this is the world we now live in, an alliance of the elite and mob destroying the multilateral order. And the point is, I, I'm sorry, it, I wish I could do some, something that was actually funny and make you all laugh, but none of this is making me laugh anymore. It, it is... The, the, the phenomenon of the global south, of the bought election, of the corrupt, clearly corrupt politician, of the knowing, uh, co the, the knowing acquiescence by the state media, all is coming to us. And it, none of it is funny. The only good thing is that I think we do have a, 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 an educated generation we, and we have people with high stakes in order, in, 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 the, in the liberal order. And 
And I think out of that, we can fashion something that will that will can give them a run for their money. Can I, can I because w I'm, I'm conscious that I want to bring the audience in, but there's, yeah. there's bits of the here and now that I'd really like your take yeah. on, because we, here we are kind of, you know, a couple of months away from precisely the kind of chaos you've just been articulating. But I'd like to, to bring in party politics. For yeah, me, why cause not? Because you're, you're a, a guy who's, as I said, chapped in a lot of doors for the Labour Party, but I've rather fallen out with them over Brexit. But you said something that really um, hit home with me. You said that for people on the left or in the centre left or wherever they are on the spectrum, you said it's a question of urgent versus important. Yeah. So even if people were motivated by hugely by a single issue, mm. maybe it was climate change or maybe it was something else, but if they had to find a way to collaborate, to pool the resources, their 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 energetic resources in order yeah. to focus on what was really important. And God knows we've got something really important in front of us now. Yeah. So I mean let me just explain the evolution of, of, of the way I've I've thought. For me, in 2015, the main problem was the neoliberal elite, Macron, Merkel, you know, Sarkozy, um, the IMF, the ECB, you know, smashing Greece, uh, being prepared to demonstratively destroy a democracy. And, and I still can't forgive them for that. But, but the 30s tells us that the only antidote to an alliance of the elite and the mob, when it's on the march and it's and it, and it is got huge specific gravity, you know, an alliance of the far right and the right in rules Austria, an alliance of the far right more lose, rules America. You the only back to Britain. Yeah, but look, come back. So the only, the only antidote to the elite mob is the center and the left making a temporary alliance. That's all it is. Now, so, so for me now in Britain, yeah, I, I, let's, start, let's start with this. Forget any future free elections if Boris Johnson wins an election. And you might think that's a, a drastic thing to say, but you know, he's put Chloe Westley, who, who is from the Taxpayers Alliance, who tweeted support for the far right. She's now his social media manager. The Leave campaign boss, who manipulated the Brexit campaign and is in contempt of parliament, is his chief of staff. Jacob Rees-Mogg, you know, uh, I'm not, again, it's beyond joking about Rees Mogg. That thing that he did with grammar was a, was a, a way of showing contempt to your children. In, 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 in it wasn't about the civil servants. Don't put commas here. Don't use the word very. It was contempt for your child in a British comprehensive school. That was what he was doing. We can show contempt because we can. What will they do if they get their hands on the levers of state? Well, we know the levers of our constitution are very, very fragile. Look at what they're doing now. Johnson is putting out taxpayer-funded propaganda videos for him, for the Conservative Party. Right, so what do we need to do? We need to, we need to stop Johnson winning the snap election that he's gonna call. How do we do that? Well, that's where I've, I've spent my spring and summer. Yeah, not so much fighting. It's not so much like fighting. It's more like, it's more like sumo wrestling, really. Uh, uh, the, the people in my party who don't get this, who, yeah, I, you know, I don't want to impute motives to them, but they just don't get it. There are people who, th who still want Brexit. And that's not just Kate Hoy, my MP, um, unfortunately. Uh, you know, Vauxhall is the most liberal part of London, but she's for some reason, you know. In a way. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> let's stay, stay off Kate Hoy. But, um, but it's, it's people, people that like Lisa Nandy from, in, from Wigan, where I come from, who just can't persuade their own electorate and they're frightened they're going to lose their seats. So I'm trying to, you know, what we're trying to say to them is there's one big problem, and that is forget the idea of you know, jobs in Lee or forget the idea of, uh, en of even fighting climate change uh, effectively if these guys take power properly. Then what it'll be, it'll be a proxy government of Nigel Farage. Anybody who thinks that Johnson, it's just the same as with Trump. People said, oh yeah, it, it, Trump was a Democrat. You know, Trump, you know, Trump's not really an evangelical Christian, so he, he won't be too tough on abortion. You know, no, I mean, look, he's put children in jail. You know, he's put ch separated children from their parents. But what about your party and its um, terminal ambivalence over well, Brexit? Okay, look, uh, th th there's two problems. Th there's 
but there's two problems. What, the, the, the ambivalence arises from not just the desire to represent the whole British working class, which, you know, m m even though you think that might be sort of, um, you know, sentimental, it is some, if you're an MP for Stoke or for Lee or for parts of the Yorkshire, that is what, who you represent. Is there's no other, you know, there's nothing else. See, so in, in, my, in my term where I come from, in the working men's clubs, there's momentum here, like ex miners from who are in left Corbynist, Bennett's, etc. And there's UKIP over there, if you're lucky, and not the BMP. UKIP, which is now the Brexit Party. And they shout at each other. What there isn't is a political centre in a lot of parts of working class England and Wales in, in, in communities. And, and so the party, you know, it took them a long time to, to get off the we have to honour the referendum. And I think uh, me and my co conspirators have managed to persuade the party leadership to have a referendum in all cases, to vote remain in any referendum that gets called. But the last piece of the jigsaw is to convince them, and I think most of the Labour front bench are convinced, but obviously not Corbyn, that they have, and this is... But you're saying, but obviously not Corbyn, I mean, strange to say he's the leader of your party. But look, the point is that, yeah, yes, and... and, and but, and he's going to be the leader, and he, I, I hope he'll become the prime minister. But whatever, well, if you don't, if you if you if you don't, there's there's two choices, aren't there? Boris Johnson c currently, you know, Boris Johnson or Jeremy Corbyn. No, I have have had my differences with Corbyn, but I've seen the way that the Labour hierarchy and front bench have reacted belatedly to the problem of of, of just losing the plot over the, the salience of Remain. They were working with a model whereby, actually it's true on the ground, Scotland's different because of the dynamic of a 62% Remain vote plus the independence dynamic. But if, if I'm honest about you know, the town I come from, the, the, the main issues are zero hours contracts, sub 10 pound an hour wages, uh, domestic violence and child poverty. That's what it is. None and of which Brexit is going to help. No, of course, but what? But in, in other words, people are not marching around worrying about Brexit. Uh, they are, actually aren't, apart from the far right people who are going around stirring people up about migration, which is for them Brexit is just get rid of the polls. That's what it is. Now, the, you can understand the mentality of somebody saying this is terrible. We need to unite people around what we. Any any comms expert will tell you if you're losing an argument, reframe the argument. And we were clearly not winning the argument with large parts of Labour's voting base over Brexit. So it was a c perfectly natural thing to do to say, reframe it around economics, reframe it around your life here now. No, that didn't work. And it didn't work. And my criticism, I mean, my criticism, you'll know that how, you, if you read the Morning Star or uh, the outpourings of some Still got big sale in se Edinburgh. senior members of, of Unite, my, well, I have been pretty roundly you know, attacked by people in Labour for this. But I said to them, look, you need to shift now. The fight is Remain versus Leave. The fight is progressive Britain versus reactionary Britain. And the quest only question is, which side are you on? And let's assemble the forces. So I'm confident that you know, look, the, 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 the logic that will be put to Jeremy or anybody else who doesn't get this is this. Stop fantasizing about a Labour Brexit you know, we'll, we'll get into power and do a better Brexit. For the simple reason, if you don't accept any of the other arguments, um, most Labour MPs will never vote for Brexit. Th there is, it is impossible for you to get a Labour Brexit through a Commons where you've won a majority because v vast numbers of your own MPs will never vote for Brexit in any cause. And so that's the, that's the final bit of the argument we're having. But can, as I, can I ask yeah. you though, here we are, we're having this conversation at the end of August. We're facing yeah. 31st of October, deal or no deal, according to the current Prime Minister. And yet I hear people from the Labour Party mm. daily in tone on the airwaves that they'll, they'll, they'll define what they really want to do when the party conference comes along. The reason and for heaven's sakes. Yeah. Look, yeah, but the reason they have to do that is that they're... Yeah, I mean, I wish that weren't true. But the, at the same time, I have to accept... Uh, I think, mean, but I'm not a decision maker here. You know, th I am somebody who's actually been pushing. No, but you're close to the people who do make the decisions. Yeah, but th I am not able to convince them. And th I'm, I'm honestly telling you and the public here what the reasons for that are. If you unite the union, okay, then you, I mean, in Scotland, unite the union per, so, 
found that quite a lot of its members supported the SNP and independence. But if you unite the union or, or the GMB or the CW unions, these are mass unions, uh, you are seeing very left-wing shop stewards turn up to ordinary meetings uh, that are not rigged, that are not in any way uh, pre-planned, and say, why haven't we left Europe? Why haven't we left Europe yet? So the labor movement is full of people who are in unions, and unions are responsive to their members. I think it's fair to say the labor membership is very strongly pro-Remain, but there are some powerful unions, and they have big clout, and it's, it's not up to me. I can argue with them. I mean, my goodness, I've been vilified by two of the main leaders of Unite publicly in the press for having this argument, but all I can do is carry on arguing them. And I only say the argument's gone our way so far, um, but, you know, where, where will we, let's talk about where we'll get to, because what Labour does in an election, I think, will, will be premised on what has happened before. And I think to, my, my contacts, you know, are good enough to be able to, to say this with some confidence. I think what's going to happen in early September is there won't be an early vote of no confidence, because the Tories won't vote for it. We know that. Um, also, some Labour MPs won't do it. I mean, th I th I'm, I'm afraid to say my own MP, Kate Hoy, won't vote no confidence to the Tories. She's, a, as far as I'm concerned, she's a, she's a Farageist. Um, no, that's our problem. We can't get rid of them without an election. So next, we have to let Grieve, Gork, Hammond have a go at taking control of Parliament and passing legislation that stops Brexit. That is what you are going to see in the next two to three weeks. No, we see how flaky they are. Because as soon as Boris Johnson comes back saying, oh, I might do a deal with Merkel, they're on the back foot again. They're to you know, the idea of a Tory rebel is, is, is not, is, you know. Which is why I'm arguing that time is absolutely yeah, of the essence. absolutely. But, but the time, look, time is of the essence and there is a choreography. So whether we, whether, if you hold a vote of no confidence early September, we won't win it. If we hold one after we've let the Tories have a go at taking control of Parliament, and if Johnson has defied them, I'm pretty confident, and this is not conjecture, I'm confident from, from the contacts I have that that's the point where they would say, right, no, we can, with, with our hands on hearts, vote no confidence without being deselected by our own... Because if you're Philip Hammond, you're worried about being deselected by your own party. Then we get the f government formation moment under the Constitution, 14 days, and that's where it gets interesting. You know, I mean, I think that, you know, Cor Corbyn should have first go, but uh, personally, I'm not wedded to Corbyn being uh, Prime Minister of a government whose l only actions are to stop no deal and call an election. Um, so we'll see where we get with that. And, and I'm afraid to say for the SNP as well, you know, anybody who thinks that, I mean, I, I will be working my butt off to make to, to reduce frictions between Labour and the SNP. You know because of my position on independence that I, I, a lot of contacts across, the, you know, across that divide. But even if they're both in the same page in the final agenda, all sorts of flaky people to the right of them, the Change UK people, the Philip Hammond, Gork, uh, Nick, Bo what's his name, Bowles, Bowles, you know, they might not in the end have the guts to stop no deal. Um, right. No, I'm, I'm so that's where we are. I'm going to stop that deal for a minute because there's, we've got not a huge amount of time. We've got lots of people. I'm sure want to. Can we move the lights up, please? Thank you. There's somebody in the front row already. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, could we have a, a mic? Thank you. And then there's somebody at the very back. Maybe you could get another mic to that chap at the back. Thank you. Hi, Paul. Uh, thanks for arguing against Lexit. Um, I'll try and keep this question laser focused um, so you you did mention you're a Marxist and one topic of conversation came up last year at the Edinburgh Festival with Terry Eagleton was whether Marxism which uh, was formed in a time of factories and and strong states uh, can st still be a useful framework um, as states get weaker and as the nature of work and, and people's lifetimes change. Thank you. So is it still relevant? Can you well, still? Well, fortunately, there's two chapters in the book about that. Um, <laughs> and and, and, and I, on one thing, I'm a, de I'm a very heretical Marxist. I think Marx was wrong about the working class. It, it, it didn't want to overthrow capitalism. It didn't bear the, the future social relations. Uh, it wanted control. It wanted more than reform, less than revolution. I've made this point in my book 
uh, post-capitalism, and I make it again at length here. And what that means for me is that the agent of overthrow for capitalism is the networked individualistic in human being. Uh, that is, I, I, or as the Italian autonomous Marxists would put it, the workers in the social factory. We are, we are exploited at work, we're exploited in our credit card, we're exploited in our sexual relations, in our friendship, in our tendency of a shit uh, council flat. We're exploited in many ways, and therefore, in our fight against exploitation, there are multiple routes for us to come together, and network technology in the last 20 years has allowed us to do that better. So in terms of the agent of change is, is a wider agent, the goal, if you've read my book, Post Capitalism, is certainly not state socialism and planning. But, uh, and so, I, but I think what is relevant, number one thing is relevant is, is, ana is the analysis. The, the ability to say, look, here is a class that is fragmenting. Here in Trump is not a maniac, it's a person following ruthless logic of his economic position. That's Marxism. The other thing is to understand the dynamics of politics. Because I find myself again and again, especially with like mainstream journalists, and I've, it's been it, throughout my life actually, but especially in the last, last few years, I always say things like, you, you do realize that, you know, things like, you do realize Tsipras will default, you know, that the, 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 the Greeks will fight. And people used to say to me, why would they do that? You know, that would be against all logic. And I said, because I understand something called the class struggle. They are going to be forced to fight. And I think it's true also to say what I said to you earlier. It is in the economic interest of Rees Mogg, Johnson, Farage, Aaron Banks, the rest of them, uh, to screw our democracy. They don't need our democracy. You know, Airbus and, uh, and Boeing and Bombardier and Nissan, they need a kind of level playing field in the rule of law. If you're in a hedge fund or uh, you know, some other shady uh, business, you don't need the rule of law. So I think Marxism is relevant there. Um, but there's a lot of it that isn't, and, and above all, because climate change overhangs this all, that climate change for me is the urgent important. Um, and, and the only reason I'm not banging on, on about climate change just even here is because we won't be able to even take step one to sort it out if Johnson, Farage and Rees Mogg are in power. Gentleman at the back, this should have the mic now, I hope. Uh, thank you. Can you comment on DM25 and whether you think they might have an ability to unite the left uh, in a way to counter a united right? So, so Yanis Varoufakis, you know, is a friend, and and I appreciate that in Greece, it, it was too late did they form a, a DM25 type party to provide a left alternative to Syriza. Um, but no, I'm not a huge supporter of the DM25 project because what it does in, in country after country is turn up and stand against and form another left against lefts that already exist. And I, I, I also think there's a confusion, um, which is, you know, I've interviewed Yanis on, in meetings like this and said, come on, um, optimism of the will, pessim of the pessimism of the intellect. Roman Roland said that, not Gramsci. But come on, do you really think you can save the EU? And, and in general, I've, I've, he's generally said no. Um, and, and I want to save the EU. I, I mean, I, I, I think I want to save it in a different form, but I, but I do want to save it. But it might not be possible because the, the centrifugal forces that have spun Britain away from it are also operating. You know, for example, I want Article 7 of the European Constitution to be applied rigorously to Poland and Hungary, up to the point of kick them out. You know, uh, if you want to save Europe, get rid of Viktor Orban's Hungary. Likewise, you know, bearing in mind that two hours ago we were talking about a perfectly peaceful 69-year-old author who is facing, who is in life imprisonment without parole for sending subliminal messages through his writing. I'm, I'm not madly keen on Turkey joining the EU. And nor am I keen on that part of it that says if you're against Turkey being in the EU, you, you, you're somehow uh, you know, abandoning it. No, we've got to be rigorously, you know, you might have guessed from this that in a defense of the Enlightenment, um, which is not a popular concept inside the, 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 the left, <coughs> I am wanting us to create a new consensus about what we are defending when we defend Europe. And, but look, I have a friendly <coughs> towards the DM25 thing. I just don't think it's worked. Let's try and get, uh, have we got a fem female sorry, hand? I, I'd like a female hand, but yes, there's one in the middle there, I think. 
I'm just being relentlessly brutal. That's good. You're brutal with yeah. me. That's what um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just oh. have a question concerning. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, you said something like um, the center and the left. This was rather vague. This, the center and the left could do something against yeah. this uh, alliance of the of reactionary capital and mob or something. Yeah. But um, just to give an example, like Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos. Is this part of the, the liberal center, these kind of people? Um, Thank you. I'm going to stop the look, and try the and get Clinton, another, Clinton look, Democrats. Question yeah, look, what I said is that the, 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 the tried and tested solution to when the, the, the far right are on the march, backed by a section of the elite and the kind of chaotic mob, as in the 30s, is a, a temporary alliance of the center and the left. It was called the Popular Front. Uh, from 1935, yes, and, 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 it, and if you were on the left in Britain, what you learn is the Popular Front was shit, it was terrible. Well, it, in the end, it, it didn't particularly work well, but what it did is it put a left government in power in Spain against what? If you study it, in 1936, there was a right-wing electoral pact to deliver fascism in Spain. Who stopped it? The liberals, the left, the Republican left, the Catalans and the communists formed a joint list, which the anarchists didn't stand on but supported, and they won. That's what made General Franco take power, the affront of the left winning when they weren't supposed to win. Three months later, in, in France, the left, the communists, the liberals did the same thing. Now, I, I, I don't know whether we'll get to that or whether we need to get to that, but I am absolutely throwing down the gauntlet to my orthodox left-wing friends that if you don't want that, what you're really doing is repeating the, oh, the problem that the, the far left did in the early 30s, class against class. You're not, i.e., I, e., you know, not just the communists, but the socialists in Germany stood back while Hitler took power and said, well, it's our turn next. I'm afraid it isn't our turn next. And it, even more, which we don't have, you know, we didn't have then, or we didn't know about it then, it's, it's not the planet's turn at all. Because if we face 10 to 15 years of right-wing government, authoritarianism, and the erosion of the rule of law in the developed world, kiss the planet goodbye. Right, one last that wasn't true in the 30s. Last question for the lady there. Paul, before the last election, I saw you on the telly, and everybody was saying it was going to be a Tory landslide. And in fact, what happened was that Labour did much better yeah. than expected. So my question is, do you think Labour can win the next election. Can you leave us on the note <laughs> of optimism? <laughs> right, okay. I certainly do think that um, the Tories can be defeated, yes. Um, and the reason I think that is not, so however, I want to caution against something that's, that's quite prevalent in the ranks of Labour, which is that we're going to repeat 2017. We're not going to repeat 2017 for many, there's many obvious reasons. Jeremy Corbyn was new then, he's not new now. There's been two years of mishaps and, and, and bad publicity, badly handled, you know, the anti-Semitism crisis has been badly handled by him, whether you think he's culpable or not, okay? In addition to which, um, you kind of, we know who he is now, there's no newness factor. So the idea that Labour on its own is going to storm from 25% up to 40, eclipsing the Lib Dems, is going, to be, is, is going to be difficult to do, but it's not the thing that you need to do. What we need to do, and I've argued this openly in, in The Guardian and, and my other articles, and you won't find many people in Labour being as honest by, about this, but here's what it is, that if we formed an electoral uh, pact, either from above or informally, there's actually, there's actually a, a, a series of no-brainers. Most of the Tory seats in Scotland, the second party is the SNP. Now, I am a member of the Labour Party, and if I were to complete the sentence I would like to say, I could actually be suspended or expelled, okay? <laughs> but you could draw your own conclusion, right? Likewise, so we need to forget all that bullshit, all that, we, you know, the party bureaucracies have to stand back because I've no doubt there's the same rule in the SNP. So we just have to get the party bureaucracies off our back. The second thing is there's 10, I think it's 10 Lib Dem, the, the organic Lib Dems, the Lib Dems who were Lib Dems, who, who, who the, their main char challenger is the Tory. So, you know, what we're going to do there in England. Uh, and then for the rest of it, it just generally involves voting Labour or for Caroline Lucas. If we do that, goodbye Boris Johnson. 
And, and that's what I will be doing. I'll, I'll sacrifice. Nye Bevan was expelled for advocating this in 1939. Nye Bevan and Stafford Cripps, the, uh, uh, the, the, the gurus of the Labour left, were both expelled from Labour for, for calling for an electoral pact with anti fascist Tories and Liberals against the Chamberlain government in 1939. And, 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 and Bevan said, I'll finish on this, he said, You've expelled Cripps, expel me. And I'm afraid there's a number of us in Labour that will start saying this if any shenanigans go on. We know that, you know, that the, the, the SNP implied our fellow, essentially fellow social democratic parties, and we're not having any other, any party sectarianism. We can leave the issue of unionism for another day. But if you think it's more, the most important thing is to stop a British Trump, and you haven't seen it yet because he's on his good behaviour. When he wins, it will, Johnson will be the, that's right, Trump called it, Britain Trump. That's it, that's what you're looking for. It's your choice, and I say to all of you, get out of your comfort zone. I'm out of mine, you can f tell. I'm hounded by my own comrades. Get out of your comfort zone and let's build something that can defeat this guy, and then everything else that flows from it can happen. Ladies and gentlemen. It might, it might not be immediately clear to you after this conversation that the title of, of Paul's book is Clear Bright Future, but, <laughs> but I do urge you um, to buy it because it's just bursting full of, of ideas, some of which you'll agree with, some of which you won't agree with, but it's, uh, it's just a, a huge tour de force around all the issues that affect us today, including one we didn't have time to get into, which is the rise of technology and what it means for all our lives. So, um, he's going to be in the main signing tent, left and left again. Meantime, please join me in thanking Paul Mason. Thank you, Ruth. Thanks for that. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Cheers.